Hello, folks of the internet, and welcome to another edition of the Onetta Football Show, brought to you by PTE Creative. As always, I am your host, Evan Davies. Football fans, we have officially made it through the hangover of the Super Bowl, and we are back to everyone's favorite season, because even the saddest of fans can get now to hope season. That is right, it is hope season, as we like to call it, here on the Onetta Show and across football circles across the world. However, I don't know if it's hope season for everybody, dude. Let's see about that. So, on today's show, I have compiled what I believe to be the master list, if you will. All 32 teams, their current starting quarterback as of the 2023 season, where they're at now. Hope season is always won by the team that gets the new quarterback. But hope means nothing if it doesn't deliver in season. So we're going to see with the current ones as of recording. This is being recorded on February 13th. As of right now, who has a quarterback, who doesn't, and their current situation is what we have to do. So without further ado, let's begin our list. Now, the parameters of this list are as follows. Kind of made three different categories, although there are fluctuations in each category of whether you are good at the quarterback position, which means you're set. You don't need to worry about anything as of right now. You need to assess your quarterback situation for cap reasons, situational reasons, limitations of the quarterback, whatever the case may be, or you just need to straight up fix it. And I was shocked at how balanced this list was, but also how many teams I felt may need to look ahead to the future. So that being said, it is listy list time. We're going to start 32 to 1. I ranked the quarterbacks in order of who I believe is the best. Comment however you like. Tell me how much you hate the list if you want to. Tell me how much you think I'm a brilliant man, because I'm the American dream that's the rules, baby. Really not, though. But nonetheless, let's get to our list now. So, At number 32, sorry Atlanta Falcons fans, I have Desmond Ritter. Um, I think Desmond Ritter is the worst quarterback in the National Football League. It was a pretty close three-way tie for me. The one benefit, the one thing, because I was never sold on Desmond Ritter as a draft analyst. I was never sold as um, Desmond Ritter even as a football fan trying to just believe in players. The one thing I was sold was the four games he played in 2022 where he didn't turn the ball over. He was very careful with the ball. That was not the case this year. His limitations were shown. He is a backup in the National Football League. You cannot have a backup as your long-term starter in the National Football League and expect to have success. He is physically limited in some of his throws. It's not as if he has a weak arm. But he just doesn't have the arm talent, the accuracy to really pay off half half the throws that he would like to attempt to make. And with the cast of characters that were around him, I think it is adequate to say that he was the limitation, not them. Um, Atlanta, you are stacked on the offensive side of the ball. That goes without question. But as long as Desmond Ritter is in your building as your starter, it will not pay off. It's just the simple truth of it. So at number 32, I have Desmond Ritter as of February 13th as the 32nd ranked quarterback among the starters, so the worst starter in the National Football League. We now go on to number 31, Mac Jones. This one might be a little controversial as many people just look at how bad the Patriots were, and they were. I don't want to dispute that. My issue with... Ritter versus Mac Jones is this. Mac Jones was a rookie of the year and showed a lot of promise and showed that he could be at his at a reasonable NFL level as in an average team could at least probably be a middle of the road starter or be a high end backup with the proper coaching. The last two years have not been kind to Mac Jones and he has shown to have Potential attitude problems. I'm not sure how real that is when you're in New England and not getting coaching properly. Um, Because I love Bill Belichick as a coach, but 
offense is not his expertise. However, there's potential attitude issues with this, potential ego issues with this. There are physical limitations to Mac Jones' game. He is far more of a throwback pocket passer than a modern athlete playing the NFL quarterback position as it is today. Um, However, I do think with a sort of rescue mission, you may be able to see Mac Jones in a functional offense at least prove that he's not the worst quarterback in the league. I have him second. I have the I have at 31. So I don't want to hear any comments like, oh, are you kidding me? Mac Jones is so much worse than everyone else. Uh, I think if you put Mac Jones with functional coaching on the Falcons, they probably win two more games simply because Mac Jones is smart enough to get the ball to the best players on the field. And half the time, Desmond Ritter didn't do that. So I'm going to say Mac Jones on that. That also goes to coaching. So, I mean, I have a lot of critiques of Arthur Arthur Smith's uh, coaching as a head coach and an offensive um, quote-unquote guru in Atlanta. But Mac Jones is my number 31 quarterback on this list. Uh, And if it's not clear by now, um, both need to be fixed. So number 32 in Atlanta, fix your quarterback situation. Number 31 in New England, um, you need to fix everything pretty much, but yeah, you need to fix your quarterback position heavily. Now we go on to number 30. It's no, the story is not much different here. It's Kenny Pickett. And apologies to the video, um, to those watching on YouTube for this show with the quality of this photo and a few others. Just picked the best I could to make sure there was a good reference for it. Kenny Pickett, I'm just going to straight up say it, not good. I knew this going into the draft. I knew this watching his tape. I knew this watching his first year when everyone in Pittsburgh wanted to say, but he's our boy. And I don't care if the guy's from his home, if if that's where the guy grew up. If the guy can't play, the guy can't play. In my opinion, Kenny Pickett can't play National Football League football. It's that simple. He, He routinely will miss throws, can't make big throws. He cannot function outside of a fourth quarter. And a lot of people would say, well, the fourth quarter is most important. That's great. But if you're out of the game by the fourth quarter because your quarterback can't play in the first three, guess what? It does not matter if he can play in the fourth. Sure, you might get one or two or three cheap wins against poor poor teams that don't have that much talent. But you cannot win crucial regular season games. You cannot win playoff football and you certainly cannot win a Super Bowl with Kenny Pickett the goal at the end of the year is to win the Super Bowl you can't even sniff the Super Bowl if Kenny Pickett is your quarterback I think Kenny Pickett is a smart enough player to be a reasonable backup that I think is fair Kenny Pickett and Desmond Ritter are picture perfect examples as to why the 2021 was it 2021 or 2022 the 2022 draft class at quarterback was just not all that exciting because it just just wasn't that good, frankly. Uh, I'm still of the opinion Malik Willis is the best of the three, and Malik Willis is far from far from quarterbacking a, a great team at this point. Um, um, that might be a little bit of a stretch. I might have to walk some of those words back, but I like Malik Willis the most because at least he's an athlete that can make something happen. Kenny Pickett can't really do that much with it, and nor can Desmond Ritter. So. Um, Pittsburgh, you got to fix your situation. You you have arguably the best defensive player in the league right now. You have a chance to go make some noise in the playoffs with a couple of your skill position guys if you can fix your quarterback situation. So that is what you need to do. Go fix it. That's number 30 on my list. Now to a change in scenery of what we need. At number 29, I have Bryce Young. Carolina is, as of this moment, I do not think it's fair to say Bryce Young is the problem. Carolina, I think it is fair to say Carolina is the problem in this situation. There was no offensive line help whatsoever, and not a whole lot of impressive players on the skill position whatsoever for Carolina. So even if you want to say, oh, just get the ball out quick and go, who was he supposed to throw to? All due respect to Adam Thielen, who showed that he still has some gas in the tank, and I owe him an apology. I didn't believe much of Adam Thielen's ability at this point in his career. 
because I saw him tailing off at his, at the end times of Minnesota. But if Adam Thielen is your true number one threat in your skill position, and then there's a great drop off to your number two receiver after Adam Thielen, that is a major problem in today's NFL. It's a major problem. When your quarterback is being hit seemingly every play, and if not every play, every other play, that is a problem, especially at the size Bryce is. I currently have Bryce Young and the Carolina Panthers at the assess the situation. Because in all due respect to Bryce, you would hope that a quarterback that is drafted number one overall with his skill set would be able to do more with the team around him than what you got. However, Carolina was so talent deficient that you can't say it's a fix-it situation at this moment in time. The issue is how do you fix it without first-round draft picks? I mean, you're going to have to pay a lot. You're going to have to overpay just to evaluate your quarterback, but I think it's worthwhile. I was super high on Bryce Young coming out of last year's draft. Um, I still am high on Bryce Young. I just think he needs to have a functional team around him. Bryce Young, I wouldn't be shocked if there was kind of quarterback if he, someone doesn't work out in Carolina, disappears for a year in an offense where he's smart enough to go somewhere where he can sit and he can learn a little bit, and then he goes out and balls out somewhere else. Um, but I think Carolina can work if they can fix the situation. So I've assessed the situation at Carolina with Bryce Young at number 29. Number 28, Daniel Jones and the New York Giants. Um, Daniel Jones has shown sparks of being able to play, but he has shown no spark of that, number one, he can stay healthy, and number two, can play consistently well enough to justify. One of the reasons Daniel Jones, if I was looking at strictly play, for this list, just strictly play, not situation, not cap, anything else. Daniel Jones, I think I probably would have bumped up a couple spots. I don't think he's, you know, God's gift to the quarterback position because he's not. But I do believe that you could get something worthwhile out of Daniel Jones with a great team around him. Problem is, I don't think the Giants have a great team on offense around him. However, with the health issues and especially the cap issues that come with Daniel Jones, that's why I had to bump Daniel Jones down to the 28, and immediately I have, I have it at the fix-it category. Um, you know, Obviously, you don't want a guy to go out due to injury, but he's just been injured the majority of his pro career. Like, What, what are you supposed to do? And he was paid off of a, a few flash games in Brian Dable's Great coaching in 2022. He wasn't paid because he was a game changer. He wasn't paid because he was a difference maker. He was paid because of great coaching. And by that alone, you need to fix this situation, which means you need to ride this year out. And unless he magically becomes a messiah in New York, it's time to fix it and it's time to go. Um, and I personally would already be looking into quarterback options. I'm I'm sorry. If you want to stay pat in the draft and a Jaden Daniels somehow falls to you or a Drake May somehow falls to you. I have not done the tape yet. But if one of those top quarterback prospects falls to you, you take it and you run with it. Or if for some reason nobody you really fall in love with is available at six, you trade down and then can get into that second tier list or third tier list of guys really in this year's draft and you really like one of them, you take them. You have to. So I, I have the Giants at fix it with number 28 and Daniel Jones. Number 27, Aiden O'Connell and his crustache. Um, nah, his mustache isn't that bad, but in some pictures it looks like just such a stereotypical 14-year-old boy trying to have a mustache. Crustache himself and the Raiders, I have at the assess the situation. Aiden O'Connell did not play poorly at the end of the season, but I don't think he did enough to justify like – Oh, we're going forward with Aiden, and there's no, there's no if ands, or buts about it. There's still room to grow in Las Vegas with the idea that you can utilize the skill position players that you have better and capitalize on your offense a bit more. 
I don't think you can have half the skill position players. That also includes, I don't know, Devontae Adams, one of the best receivers in the last 20 years. I don't think you can have a receiver like that. Josh Jacobs, who knows if he's still part of that team, but you also have more secondary receivers around Devontae Adams that I like as secondary pieces. I don't think you can take a team like that, play at Aiden O'Connell's level, and say, we're good. But I don't think he was so bad that you have to immediately go, we can't go without it. I think the Raiders are a classic example of their draft position, kind of no man's land for a quarterback. So you either have to play the free agency market, which could be tough, or you make a trade, whether it's in the draft or outside for a veteran that may be disgruntled or just the situation's not working out. But if you get stuck with Aiden O'Connell, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world, but you're going to be limited in what you can do. But I have 27 Aiden O'Connell at assess the situation. Number 26, Will Levis and the Tennessee Titans. Um, Already got nicked up, but I'm not going to count that health completely against him right away. Injuries happen. Um, It's just if you have a history of injuries, that's when I get really concerned. Um, As you can see from the photo on YouTube, guy's shredded, but that doesn't inherently mean he's going to be tough. Um, Will Levis did show some potential. Had a few highlight plays, had a few highlight games with Tennessee. I was not crazy about Will Levis coming out in the draft. I still need to see more to say he's a, a future franchise quarterback. But I will say there's potential there. And on top of that, I believe there's an argument that Tennessee's almost as talent poor as Carolina and almost as talent poor as Arizona. That's a problem for me. Um, They don't have a single skill position player after the departure that is soon to be of Derrick Henry. Traylon Burks is probably a three and he was drafted to be a one because John Robinson, the former GM, just thought, oh, I can just get rid of A.J. Brown and just replace him one for one. And that was a stupid idea. And you just lost a really good coach in Mike Vrabel. And I'm not so sure the new coach is going to work out. And unfortunately, I apologize to him. His name is escaping me at the moment. But I do think there's some potential here with Will Levis if you can get some pieces around him. I do like the Peter Skaronsky pick from last year. And I think if they can pick up some skill position players and a couple more offensive linemen to at least compete. You can assess the situation a little bit better. So I'm going to have Will Levis at assess the situation at 26. Now here's the first real superstar that we're going to talk about. If you want to say that anymore about him. Number 25 is Deshaun Watson and the Cleveland Browns. Um, what is looking to be the worst trade in NFL history at it this moment because it's just how much you gave up and the cap implications to Deshaun Watson. You've gotten zero return on it, and you've only gotten bad publicity. you got people to turn against your franchise because of the move. Deshaun Watson and that trade has been nothing but negative for the Cleveland Browns. Um, for one game this season, he started to look like the old Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson that played in Houston – who at one point I believed was the second best quarterback in the league. Because he has a little bit of that Michael Jordan-esque show up in the big moment and make a big play. When he was his former self, generally healthy by his standards, and he had nothing around him, and that's why I thought so highly of Deshaun Watson, the player, prior to his scandal. I was a huge Deshaun Watson fan prior to it. Coming out in the 2017 draft, I had... Mahomes and Deshaun Watson neck and neck. And I thought that was proving to be quite accurate prior to his departure and scandal in Houston. Um, But this has been nothing but negative for Cleveland, and they have no stability at the quarterback position. You need stability. They went through, what, four quarterbacks this year? You know, they had to get old man Joe Flacco to come be the comeback player of the year to eke them into the playoffs. I mean, you got a great team there. You have great defense. You have a good running game. You have good. You have a few good skill position players that, with a, even more compliments, could be a great skill position group as a cohesive unit. You need to fix the quarterback position, and you can't even depend on your fully guaranteed two hundred plus million dollar quarterback 
to be able to play more than one game. And you can't even guarantee in the games that he may get to play and that he's going to be good. And, you know, it, it sucks that injury is the thing that's taking that out of the equation, but, you know, it's hard to feel bad for a team that signed up for a deal with the devil and now they didn't even get anything out of it. It's kind of like a classic, you know, TV show movie. It's like, you reap what you sow, dude. Um, like I said, if you can get back to old Deshaun Watson, the Cleveland Browns can be really dangerous. I'm just now of the opinion as just a football fan and also just as someone who likes to evaluate play, Deshaun Watson doesn't have it anymore. So I still have it at the assess slash. He is one of the only, this is one of the only times I have a split where my gut says, fix it. The problem is I don't know if cap you can. That's a problem. I think you, you're stuck with Deshaun Watson for at least another year before you can really start looking into cap implications and what that could mean for your future. Um, and plus, you have a coach of the year for, I believe, the second time. Now, if I remember correctly, what I can't remember exactly, coaching your team, and do you want to tank that opportunity and take the best coach you've had since the relaunch of your franchise? For Deshaun Watson, I don't, I don't think you do, but that's that's where you're at. So it's the only mix I have of fix and assess the situation because I don't know if you can fix it with the cap the way it is in Cleveland right now. Moving on to 24 in a brighter spot, it's Anthony Richardson and the Indianapolis Colts. I really liked the flashes that we saw of Anthony Richardson. If it were not for the short amount of play and the health, he probably would have been bumped up a couple spots. I am a believer that if he can develop, he's going to be a star. He just has physical gifts, physical traits, and a character for both the game but also off the field that just shows a dedication that few players possess. Um, And that's something to be really, really sought after. My issue is he's... He was hurt multiple times this year, and you had to you had to deactivate him, and that that sucks to have, but that's the truth of the matter. Um, I have him. At, you're you're good. He's the earliest. You're good. I have because you are not gonna bail on a athletic freak like Anthony Richardson that has shown promise this early, and I wouldn't either. I think. The Colts have their future quarterback if his health can stay out. My issue is concussions can be a real sneaky bitch. Like, they can come and get you hard, and they can haunt you for a long, long time. Um, Play a lot of mind games, even other injuries can't. Um, But on top of that, he also had another serious injury that took him out. So you just hope that that's not going to derail his career. I certainly hope it doesn't. I think as long as the health goes through, Anthony Richardson's going to be a lot higher on this list come 2024 to 2025. But in early 2024, after the 23 season, I have him at number 24. But the Colts are all good with Anthony Richardson. Oh, boy. Number 23. Broncos country. Don't ride. <laughs> Again, sorry for the blurry picture, YouTube. Russell Wilson. Um, it is beyond obvious right now that uh, it looks like Russell Wilson's not going to play another down for the Denver Broncos. I just don't think he and Sean Payton mesh well from a pure coaching standpoint and football standpoint. It just doesn't work out. Um, Russell Wilson did play better. You know, a lot of I I would have been tempted. I think I when I did this preseason, I had Russell Wilson all the way down at like twenty five to twenty seven. Like that's how bad he was last year, and I think he was only that high because there were rookies and unproven talent in that list. Um, <laughs> he showed more with Sean Payton as his coach, but not enough for me to go like, oh, the old Russ that was a top ten quarterback in the league is going to come back or a fringe top 10 quarterback is going to come back. I don't see that in his current play. 
Um, could he maybe go somewhere and revive a little bit? Maybe. Uh, but as of right now, I don't think so. Uh, he is an obvious fix-it for me for Denver. The issue is it's kind of the cap situation. All reports are looking like it's going to be he, they're going to move off of him and just take the cap hit, get a rookie. But in their draft position, that could be a little difficult. So where do you go from there? Um, so I, I have a fix-it on this one, but it, it's going to be tough. And I'd, I'd love to see where Russell Wilson goes because I don't think his playing days in the NFL are completely over yet. But I don't think um, his days as a star are ever going to return. So I got fix it at number 23 with Russell Wilson and the Denver Broncos. Now moving on, number 22. It is Sam Howell and the Washington Commanders. This is kind of the start of a of a new tier for me. I just look at, in some way, shape, or form, outside of a few exceptions, twenty three down to thirty two is that that quarter essentially of the league is kind of in no man's land, and you're you're almost dead to rights on arrival. I think this is where you can at least start thinking about a future. However, I don't think Sam Howell is the long-term guy. He kind of strikes me as Baker Mayfield light. And Baker Mayfield full has not really panned out. I think Sam Howell can play. And I think his play showed that. But I don't think he showed enough to stay in the starting position at Washington. But if, you know, especially on a rookie deal still. You want to throw him in Pittsburgh? You want to throw him up in New England as they try to rebuild? Even Atlanta? Um, Vegas? I think those are all upgrades. Uh, I think it's strictly because Washington, the position that franchise is in, new ownership is in, and the draft position that they got, they can get a difference maker at the quarterback position that Sam Howell isn't going to be. So I have Sam Howell 21 or 22 at fix it, but it's not so much a critique of Sam Howell. It's so much more situational of where it is because I think Sam Howell played decently well for a good part of the season. It's just Washington as a team was just kind of lost and it just felt like Ron Rivera knew he wasn't going to be coaching much longer. Everybody seemed to know that, you know, that uh, that era of the franchise was dead and gone. But I don't think that's a full reflection on Sam Howell. I think Sam Howell actually played pretty well in a lot of spots. Um, so I'm going to go Sam Howell 22, but I still say fix it because it's Washington that we're specifically speaking with. And then final outside the top 20, the draft world's biggest conversation right now. Justin Fields and the Chicago Bears. This is extremely complex because we live in a world that is both one that people want it to be a meritocracy and want to make sure everyone, but also we want to live in a world in which it's stereotypical modern day kindergarten and everyone gets a chance. And Justin Fields is somewhere in the middle. There's been flashes that Justin Fields can play at the NFL level. And then there are games where you go, where after he has a hot game or a hot game or two, he gets a little streaky. You're like, oh, whoa, maybe maybe there's something here with Justin Fields. And then he just completely shits the bed and doesn't show up. And throws wildly inaccurate passes and goes back to a, a draft analysis that myself and, and many others. I just, I'm not the only critic that he had in the draft had. My biggest thing is I don't think he can throw accurately short to low intermediate routes with touch, with timing. I think he's better intermediate and deep, but that's not how the modern NFL game is run. You start short to intermediate and then go deep as the third option. 
and the skill set is reversed for Justin Fields from a passing standpoint. Running, that's not a problem. He's a phenomenal athlete. He's a running threat. That is why he's as high as on this list as possible. And he did develop a little bit as a passer. I have to give him that credit. Um, and please, Bear fans or anybody on the internet, don't say I'm just biased because I'm a Packer fan. But simply, Justin Fields hasn't panned out yet. So, you know, there are going to be some that say, oh, no, he didn't get the fair shake, and there's been at least two coaches with him, and the offenses, coordinators, but changed a couple times, and, and they didn't have anything around him. Okay, well, this year they kind of did. And they had a little bit of continuity. And it just didn't work out for him. You know, I think he'd be a great trade candidate for a couple teams that just need to live on it up. I'd love to see Justin Fields in a Pittsburgh or Atlanta. Um, you know, even the Giants, if they want to trade it just because his contract isn't that big right now, just to escape a Daniel Jones, at least you could say he's going to run, he's going to move, and maybe he'll free up some receivers downfield and see what you got. But, and I don't think that's a serious one, mind you, but I would even like to see that over him just stay in Chicago and then constantly hear for Bear fans, oh, what could have been, and oh, he should be this, or he should be that. It's like, you have a golden opportunity for what I have not gotten to the tape yet, so I'm not saying this. But what many pundits are already saying is the best quarterback prospect since Andrew Luck, including Trevor Lawrence. Like, people are talking about Caleb Williams as if he is Patrick Mahomes. I have watched six minutes of tape, as in real tape, on Caleb Williams. I was impressed. I was more impressed in those six minutes than I ever was in all the Justin Fields evaluations. And I can say, because the draft year that he came out, I watched more Justin Fields tape, I believe, than and I watched more Justin Fields tape and that quarterback class, probably more than any other class I've ever watched, besides maybe 2020 when I had all the time in the world, like the rest of the world. But I have, I'm going to put it at a cess because it's up to Chicago to make the thing, and some people think Justin Fields should stay. To me, it's a fix it, but I'm going to officially categorize it as an assess the situation because there's potential. But how long are you going to keep going on unrealized potential when you have the golden ticket right in front of you? So assess the situation 21, Justin Fields. Here we are, number 20, Derek Carr. Derek Carr's days as a, as a good passer, I think, are behind him. Derek Carr's not bad, but Derek Carr's never going to get you over the hump. Um, it's assessed the situation, but I know his cap hit is quite large. I believe it's in the $40 million range. Um, that is the going rate for quarterbacks, which I understand. But it's been year after year after year, and they slowly just keep getting closer and closer to it. This New Orleans Saints team is eventually going to blow up. It, you can't keep doing vibes and all this stuff if we're going to hold on and cling and cling and cling to the past. And that feels like what the Saints are doing, and it feels like Derek Carr was their way of saying, see, no, we're, we're switching it up. And Derek Carr wasn't an answer. Derek Carr was kind of a consolation prize to allow you to continue poor management of a roster, in my opinion. There are pieces in New Orleans, don't get me wrong. I really like Chris Olave. But there is not enough there for me to go, yeah, you can, you can be a real playoff contender with Derek Carr. And I'm sorry, as long as Derek Carr is your quarterback, you're not a real Super Bowl contender. It's just not the case. Um, it's assessed the situation because he's better than a lot of options, but he's worse than a lot of other quarterbacks. So where you go is up to you. I have it assessed the situation at 20, Derek Carr and the Saints. 19, Geno Smith and Seattle Seahawks. I think it's going to be really interesting what happens to Geno with this new coaching staff, especially now that most of the guarantees in his contract, I believe, have passed. I believe there was heavy guarantees the first year to make sure he got a real shake as the starter. 
in Seattle this past year with Pete Carroll. However, um, it, it's I think Geno's a better player right now than Derek Carr is. I think Geno also has a little bit more of that show up in the big moment than Derek Carr. I'm not saying it's exponentially more, but I think Geno Smith can actually surprise a few people because he's willing to throw it downfield at the right times, where I think Derek Carr won't throw it downfield until it's the wrong time. Geno Smith also has the benefit of better receivers and everything else. Um, this is where the uh, we're, we're splitting hairs to a degree. I just prefer Geno Smith as a player. I have it, again, assess the situation. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if they were somehow in the quarterback market and we didn't know really about it yet, but I think they're a year away from the quarterback market. I think Geno can still play at a level that can get you to the playoffs, but I'm not sure Gino can get you to a Super Bowl. So I have Gino at 19 and Seattle at 19 assessing the situation. 18. Baker Mayfield. The interesting thing about Baker is this. He played really well and probably won't get a lot of credit for how well he played as the offseason continues. Because people are going to get set back into the ways of, oh, it's just Baker Mayfield. I'm sorry, Baker Mayfield played really well in Tampa Bay. And the best thing about Baker Mayfield, and I don't think that anyone could argue this, besides the moxie, besides the, all the things that people kind of like about his chippy attitude, is this. Baker Mayfield, come hell or I water, outside of OBJ in Cleveland, has always been the guy that's going to get the ball to your best players. He's kind of old school in the fact that he's just like, why would I throw it to others if I can get the ball to Chris Godwin or Mike Evans? In Cleveland, it was Jarvis Landry when he was the number one threat. Um, you know, he he was wherever the best receiver is, that's his first look for the most part. He's going to follow the play, but he's going to get the ball to your playmakers. That's, a, that's something that a lot of quarterbacks that I've listed previous to him don't have the skill set to do, which is insane to me. Uh, use your skill position players to their best abilities. That's what Baker Mayfield does. But he also learned to be a lot more careful with the ball, and, and he was not nearly as careless as he was criticized for being in the past, rightfully so. Uh, so I got Baker Mayfield at 18. And personally speaking, I may take him over the next guy. Uh, but again, I still am not sold that Baker is your future. I think it's going to take another year to say, oh, yeah, Baker's our guy. But he played well enough that he deserves the shot to go prove it. And I don't think Tampa's in the market to go get another quarterback uh, to build for the future. So I think Baker's your option. So I say technically assess the situation. But I personally would feel positive about Baker Mayfield in Tampa because of this year. And then the final member of the bottom half. And again, I've said positive things about a lot of the guys behind this, but uh, I'm going to get so much hate for this one. I don't really care because it's the truth. At 17, Jalen Hurts of the Philadelphia Eagles. Jalen Hurts, before everyone starts freaking out and screaming over all this and everything else, is this. Jalen Hurts just played so poorly for a good portion of the year beyond just the time that the whole team, including him, quit. Q-U-I-T, quit in Philadelphia this year. But Jalen Hurts is limited from a reading the field perspective. He has the physical ability to make a good amount of throws. Not all the throws, in my opinion, but a good amount. But his options have always been, you have to get it to A.J. Brown quick, or you have to get it to Devonta Smith quick, or you run. I don't think Jalen Hurts is at the point now, and I don't think he's getting the coaching from Sirianni and the rest of the staff to continually develop. And also, he has the benefit of one of the best offensive lines we've seen in the past 20 years working with him, and they figured out a cheat code, which was just get it close, and then we can just shove him forward. Um, and I know that that sounds kind of basic sports talky, but it's the truth. Jalen Hurts is limited as a passer. 
He's a great athlete. And I actually, unlike a lot of people, had a positive assessment of him coming into the draft. I thought he could be a starting quarterback in the NFL. But this is where I thought he could be. It's kind of where he is, maybe a little up from there, maybe a little down. He's had one phenomenal season. But Robert Griffin III had a phenomenal season. There's been other players that had a phenomenal season. And then we saw their limitations. We saw what they couldn't do. I am of the belief, after especially the way it ended, unless some crazy voodoo seance goes on in Philadelphia, Philadelphia is not making the playoffs next year. I think Philadelphia is on the verge of a collapse because I also think Nick Sirianni is not that good of a head coach. But Jalen Hurts is a part of that team, and I think Jalen Hurts has limitations, and where they go is going to be determined on whether their coaching staff, A, can get it together to the point where they can even control their sideline. And yeah, I'm talking about the Dom situation in Philly, and I do not care because it's the truth. But Philly, let's be honest, was a shit show for the entire back half of the season. And before that was teetering on the edge of collapse, and they just kept eking out these little wins. Perfect example is the Kansas City game. Marquez Valdez-Scantling, who can catch it in the playoffs but can't catch it in the regular season, if a ball doesn't go straight through his hands, picture perfect on a deep route, they don't escape Kansas City. They don't escape a lot of other games either. They weren't even as good as their record showed. They were a shit show this year. Jalen Hurts was a large part of that. So I have Jalen Hurts at 17. I know I'm, I'm truly not trying to be that critical because 17 is a lot. Is still, <laughs> there's still 15 slots below him. But I can't say the positive from the past year for me is going to automatically just outweigh everything I'm now seeing in Jalen Hurts. So I have Jalen Hurts at 17 in the back half of the NFL. And again, 20 to 15, even 14, is it's starting to split hairs, but there starts to get separation. So I have Jalen Hurts that assess the situation, but the cap number is going to be difficult, but I think you may have to do it. In Philadelphia, I will say this, when they feel they've made a mistake in money, we'll move off. So if Jalen Hurts has a collapse season, don't be shocked if Jalen Hurts isn't there in 2025. I'm not rooting for anything in terms of Jalen Hurts, the person or the player. I have no bones about it. I do not like the Philadelphia Eagles as a team. And that's the fan in me. But I'm trying to be an analyst and tell you the truth. I'm trying to give you a true assessment here. So I think it's going to be assess the situation because there's a lot of good in Philadelphia on that roster. I just don't think the coaching staff can bring it out on a consistent basis. And I like they lost the entire spirit of the team and they quit last year. So I don't have high hopes for Philadelphia. Now we make it to the top half of the league. And again, this is going to be another controversial one for many people. It's Trevor Lawrence. Lawrence, this is very injury related and team related. But Trevor Lawrence, we have to assess the real play that we've seen. Trevor Lawrence came in as the Messiah. And then he was saddled with Urban Meyer. No joke. That sucks, and that's obvious, but year one is a lost year, and regardless, he didn't play well in it. It wasn't like there was bright spots for Trevor, but you could just tell the rest sucked around him. There weren't many bright spots for Trevor in year one. Year two, he heated up at the end of the year, and he was getting a lot better. But he still didn't really start year two, which is the 22 season, all that well. He, he looked like he was a middle-of-the-road kind of guy and then heated up to where you're like, oh, I see some of this potential coming out. I see where Trevor Lawrence could go. And he got a very high ranking at the start of the season by many analysts and many media members because of it. But he is shown to have a few limitations that people didn't think he saw. But I think that's gonna those kinks will be worked out with development. And I think Doug Peterson can coach quarterbacks. I think he's shown that to be the case. However, if Jacksonville cannot fix their offensive line and protect him, if Jacksonville cannot get complimentary pieces to just keep him upright, the Messiah will not bring the second coming in Jacksonville, and Jacksonville will continue to be what they are, which is a poor franchise. That has been the history of the Jaguars since the beginning, except for the Mark Brunel, Tom Coughlin years. 
for the vast majority of their history, they have not been good. And it's because of moves that they can't get their front office right. And right now, they need to get their front office right to make sure that even, I'm not saying changes or anything crazy, but they need to get it through their thick skull. Yo, we got our ticket at quarterback. We need to protect it so that ticket doesn't go up in flames. So that is why I have Trevor Lawrence at 16. I think, I think they're good. I think you're set at quarterback, but there are things that need to be fixed if you're going to still be set at quarterback with Trevor Lawrence. Now, here comes even more fire from the internet. Number 15 on my list. Tua Tungavailoa and the Miami Dolphins. I'm going to straight up say it. I say it with my friend Brandon constantly. He's also a really, really good football mind. Tua Tungavailoa is not a good NFL quarterback. Lacks arm strength. Lacks arm talent. Does not have the full capability to make the Miami Dolphins what they could be. You saw what Tua really is before they got Tyreek Hill. To me, Miami is as good as they are because they have Tyreek Hill and they have Jalen Waddell and they have a decent offensive line and they have incredibly, they are a speed team that can just outrun you and outgun you. But the gun in this perspective is a pea shooter in my opinion. And the accuracy on Tua isn't as good as people made it out to be. And I want to be clear. Because you may be still be able to track this down somewhere on the internet because um, it's been so long. I did one day, I did have a football blog at one point. And in a fairness of a situation and trying to broaden my horizons and be a better um, evaluator, I tried looking at the positives of Tua coming out of college. Incredibly accurate um, coming out of college, great distributor of the ball. Those, that was my assessment. I was not crazy about it, but I kept saying, no, I, I got to be wrong on this one. I didn't trust my gut. And I was trying to be fair in an assessment. So you may find that. And I still stand by the analysis of it. But that was never my guy. If you actually look at what I really wanted to do in that draft, it was, it was Joe Burrow... I then would have had Jordan Love too, and that's going to sound crazy, I know, and I'm a Packer fan, so people aren't going to believe me, but I wanted to have Burrow 1, Love 2, and then I would have split hairs between Herbert and Tua. There were some red flags to me in the, in the personality profile of Justin Herbert that were clearly proven to be wrong, and you'll see that later in my evaluation here. But Tua, all the things I never liked about Tua are still a major problem. They need to assess that situation. And the fact that their GM, Chris Greer, is like, we're going to keep Tua here for the long run, that is a ticket to say, we're going to make the wild card round every year and we're never going to get past it. Maybe one year we'll make the divisional round. Isn't that awesome? Miami Dolphin fans, your greatest years were the early 70s under Don Shula, no-name defense, and everybody else on that team with the three-headed monster in the backfield. And then the Dan Marino years that unfortunately you just couldn't get over the hump. That is going to be, you're going to relive the 80s and 90s again if you keep two as your quarterback. I promise you that. Tua Tungabailoa is not a Super Bowl winning quarterback. He might, keyword might, be a playoff winning quarterback. And thus far, hasn't even done that. And I don't think he will. So I have assessed the situation of Tua Tungabailoa and 15 at Miami. And two and on, come at me. I don't care because you're wrong. You have no idea what you're talking about. All righty. 14. And again, oh, God, I'm going to take so many shots on the internet. It's Brock Purdy. I honestly thought Brock Purdy might be lower on this list for me. I'm not a Brock Purdy fan as a quarterback. I think he has limitations. Brock Purdy, I think, is the upgraded version of Tua, where I think he does have more arm strength, and I think he does have more arm talent than Tua. I think, he, I think he's not as good with timing routes, possibly, but I think he's understanding of where to get rid of the ball earlier and has far more athleticism than Tua to make something happen if things break down. Those are the really good qualities of Brock Purdy. He's a good distributor of the ball, uh, and he's going to run the Shanahan offense the way it is. 
and the way it's set up to be, which is one of the best offenses that there is. Um, and Brock Purdy, I gave a really good, uh, I would I would say he played really, really well in the Super Bowl. He just got outplayed by Patrick Mahomes. A lot of things I don't like about Brock Purdy that we saw in the previous games against Green Bay and Detroit where he looked awful, specifically that Green Bay game. Those didn't show up in the Super Bowl, and I can see why people really like Brock Purdy. But Brock Purdy, to me, is still too physically limited and is too dependent on a system to make him great. I don't think Brock Purdy is great and is elevating the system. I think that's the easiest way for me to explain it so people can understand it's not a Brock Purdy hate thing. It's a Brock Purdy limitation thing for me. But I will say this. I have Brock Purdy and the 49ers at the you're good. I don't know what you can do in your current draft situation and cap situation that they're going to have to ride out for another year. Because pretty much after 2024, everyone comes due in some way, shape, or form. Uh, Some of your good players age to the point where you're like, I don't know if I want to pay him again. Some of your other players are just due for big contracts, including Brock Purdy. So you kind of have to ride with him no matter what, and I do think it's not a bad idea. I think Brock Purdy, I will say this. This is going to be crazy to me because I never thought it would come out of my mouth. I think Sunday showed you can win a Super Bowl with Brock Purdy given the opponent is not Patrick Mahomes or another elite quarterback. That is something I never thought would come out of my mouth. However, I don't think it's realistic to believe they're going to do it. That's just my opinion. But that's where I'm at with Brock Purdy, and I have them at 14, but I think you're all good in, with Brock Purdy in San Francisco. Number 13, Arizona and Kyler Murray. I have no problem admitting this. I'm a big Kyler Murray fan. I think Kyler Murray is one of the most gifted athletes that anyone can ever see just from a shifty, quick perspective. He's a phenomenal runner. But he also has an insane ability to make crazy throws. People don't give enough credit to Kyler for what he can do. I wouldn't say he's the greatest deep arm passer we've ever seen, but he can throw deep and make big plays. And unlike Tua, where you see Tyreek Hill beat someone by 20 yards and it looks like he only beat him by 10 because he's got to wait for the ball, Kyler can still hit you in stride, and that's not going to be a problem. I also think Kyler's ability to make things happen is definitely higher than almost anybody in the league for the most part. There's a few quarterbacks right above him that cannot play nearly as well as he does when the play breaks down to me this is what this is kind of the dividing line i feel like i'm gonna have to continually compare it to brock purdy for a little bit i feel like if kyler murray's san francisco quarterback brock purdy isn't they probably could have pulled out super bowl 58 because i think at least a couple of those plays that broke down in which purdy couldn't get out of the way of of um, broken blocks Kyler probably couldn't have been able to make somebody miss and do something. Um, and I do think he could have took off to take a couple runs when, when given the opportunity. Uh, I really like Kyler, and I just think the Cardinals are so talent poor, and Kif- Cliff Kingsbury clearly was not, at this stage in his career, capable of being an NFL head coach. So that's why I have Kyler at 13. I just I think Kyler... At one time, I had Kyler as high as seven, and I'm extremely high on Kyler, and I think his play, for the most part, has proven my evaluation of him to be correct. Uh, I'm not saying there isn't some things to work on. He's still developing as a passer, but I think this year really showed that in a true offense, he can develop as a passer, and he can play really well. He was making nobodies effective, and they were a really, really competitive team and could beat good teams down the stretch with Kyler as their quarterback. So I'm going to go Kyler at 13 in Arizona, and you are all set with Kyler. You're great with Kyler there. Number 12. Time to give this guy his flowers. It's Minnesota, Kirk Cousins. Um, I'm going to lead with this, though. I think it's an assess the situation because I just don't know what they're going to do cap-wise with Justin Jefferson coming up. Daniel Hunter's up for a contract, and you've got a soon-to-be 36-year-old quarterback coming off an Achilles. That's why I'm going to give you the answer of assess the situation. 
However, Kirk Cousins has been playing lights out football for the most part this past year before he got hurt. And last year, he was playing really, really well. I think he just meshes with Kevin O'Connell in that Minnesota offense. And especially with Justin Jefferson, K.J. Osborne, and T.J. Hawkinson, they have a really, really good core skill position pieces. If it were me in Minnesota, if I could make it work, I'd sign Kirk back to like a two-year. And also know full well, I'm going to go try to find a, a quarterback to develop behind him. Because my issue is the Achilles coming off of that. That's the only thing that's really hurt me to think that it's a shoe in that you got to sign Kirk back. But Kirk has played really, really well. The accuracy has just been phenomenal. The deep throws, the um, ability to just start making plays when things start breaking down has gone up tremendously with Kevin O'Connell. It's insane to say, but it has. And he's playing with a great confidence and belief in himself that I don't know was there before that you could truly say it. Uh, and Kirk's playing really, really well and has continued, continued to get better and better. That is one thing no one can argue. Kirk Cousins has gotten a lot better with time. And that is why I have Kirk at 12. But I think because of the cap situation and the injury to the Achilles, it's an assess the situation just because of the weird, unique place Minnesota's in having to pay a few people. They have a young, old roster with a lot of young pieces, but aging core players that continually are still phasing out. Um, so that's why I'm going to say assess the situation with her cousins. Number 11, and it hurt me to put him this low. It's Jordan Love, baby. Um, I'm going to tell you this right here, right now. The future of quarterback position in Green Bay is Jordan Love. Jordan Love, talent-wise, I think belongs higher on this list, but I had to play, I had to play fair with consistency in my mind. Um, so there's a few people that I would have lower on my preference list as my quarterback that are higher than him. Jordan Love, remember, this is his first time getting to start. Week one looked great. Week two still played pretty well. Um, and then there were all these moments during that about six game window where people started losing faith that you could still see there's something really special about him. You know, in the Saints game, he didn't play tremendously well, but the fourth quarter, he was lights out and really, really, he propelled Green Bay to that win over the Saints. And I don't think you need to look any further than the Chiefs game or the Dallas game to see Jordan loves the dude. And anyone who wants to complain about it, I understand the greatest franchise in terms of quarterback history just got themselves another one, in my opinion. Jordan Love is the truth in Green Bay, and I think, especially with the young roster they have, it's only going to get scarier. I have the utmost faith in Jordan Love. And I understand people are going to say, oh, you're biased. You're a Packer fan. I get it. I do get it. But I think the play down the stretch really shows he's great. If I was going to knock anything, it's the fact that he had that game won in San Francisco and couldn't put the nail in the coffin. They outplayed San Francisco. Green Bay was better than San Francisco. San Francisco shouldn't even made it to the, to the NFC Championship game, let alone the Super Bowl this year, because the Packers were a better team. They just couldn't put them away when they needed to. 99.9% of that game, Green Bay was the better team, and it's mostly because Jordan Love played his ass off in that game and put them in positions to win. The arm talent is there. The arm strength is there. The mechanics are continually getting better with Jordan Love. His ability to make insane throws is, is easily top 10 in this league, and I'd have to look and see who's better. There's a few obvious ones that are better, but... There's not many people that are going to make insane throws like Jordan Love. Especially some of those sideline throws that he's able to make, especially scrambling. They're insane. Jordan Love is really good. Um, and people better watch out. He's only going to get better. Jordan Love's the truth, dude. So watch out. And that's why I got number 11. Stay pat. You're all good in Green Bay. You know, my home state, we've got ourselves a quarterback once again in Jordan Love. 
Number 10, kind of one of the cases I brought up before. It's Jared Goff. Jared Goff, I think it's unfair at this point to continually hold Los Angeles against him because Jared Goff has played really well in Detroit. Um, I To the point where I even can see him in Lambeau probably beating the Packers in this picture and going, it, it's deserved and earned. Jared Goff's played really, really well for the Lions. I have the assess the situation because of this. I think still the 49er game, there were a few other games this season where you could see there are still limitations to Jared Goff being a top-tier finishing quarterback where you have faith that Jared's going to finish the game and be the guy. But I think it's kind of crazy that for someone like Tua, so many people give the pass to knowing he's never going to be the guy. But someone like Jared Goff, who has inarguably played better than Tua Tungavailoa his entire career for the most part, is always going to be, yeah, but. Yeah, but. It's kind of like the Kirk Cousins things. Yeah, but. They always just are going to keep criticizing the guy. Jared Goff has played really, really well. And if someone wants to say, oh my God, Jared Goff, top 10 quarterback, make your own list. See what I'm seeing. Watch the games and tell me his play is not top 10 worthy compared to the other guys on this list when you take into account time, situation, everything else in the league. Um, I do still have concerns about Jared Goff. He's still not a great outdoor thrower. And when you play in the NFC North, you're going to get at least two big division games that are outdoors and are probably going to suck weather-wise in Chicago and Green Bay specifically. You're always going to get more outdoor weather somewhere. And also, my other concern is this, is cap. That's why I've assessed the situation. I think Jared Goff can be and should be the guy for Detroit. The issue is what do you pay him? Because I'm not sure. I don't think many people are worth quarterback market money. Okay? That's a big thing for me. However, that is the going rate for a market quarterback, and he's going to be coming due for a contract soon. So I've assessed the situation on that one. However, I don't think you can argue. Jared Goff has played really well has done worlds of good for the Lions and deserves a lot of credit, and he's a top-10 quarterback. I have assessed the situation for Jared Goff, but I, I think it is well-deserved that he's a top-10 quarterback at this point. And now we start getting interesting. Number nine, Houston Texans, C.J. Stroud. You are good. I've said this before in a previous podcast. I've said it privately to a lot of people that I am always talking football with. wasn't crazy about C.J. Stroud. I thought he was Kirk Cousins when I was not evaluating Kirk Cousins as highly as I am now. I thought he was Kirk Cousins a little bit with a little bit more athleticism. I was wrong. And now it, I'm almost buying into the Kirk Cousins hate again. That's not the, that's not the goal is to reflect how good C.J. Stroud. C.J. Stroud was a revelation to quarterback this year. C.J. Stroud played so well. The accuracy was there. The big plays were there. The ability to elevate. That's a big thing with these guys. How many guys are elevating their teammates? To me, that really starts at 13 with Kyler Murray. It's like that. I'm just looking over the list quick. Just going, oh. I think that starts with Kyler Murray elevating other players. C.J. Stroud elevated Tank Dell to be a great player. Nico Collins to be a great player. And yes, great coaching is coming there. D'Amico Ryans clearly believes in him and puts the ball on his hands. Bobby Slowick is doing wonders with him. Houston's finally got their front office together to make them a competitive team. They're going to be a threat in the AFC. Trust me. But C.J. Stroud played so ungodly well compared to my comparison. I was very happy to be wrong on that one. I'm never rooting against a player unless they're just a shit person. C.J. Stroud is not that. C.J. Stroud, from all reports, is a good dude. Never going to root against the guy outside of just fan, oh, I want my team to win versus his team. C.J. Stroud played incredibly well. I can't. I just keep repeating it because it's the truth. All the good things that I saw in little glimpses but didn't think he was willing to do were all there on the tape this year from the college to football to pro football transition. 
he played tremendously well. And that is where you have to say C.J. Stroud is a top 10 quarterback now. Played phenomenal. That's why I have C.J. Stroud at number 9. And now we get to the top 25% of the week. Um, and honestly, this is crazy for me to say because I think it's the weakest case for top 25. At number 8, it's number 8 himself. For the New York Jets, it is Aaron Rodgers. Obviously, I have a very large amount of affection for Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers um, truly brought me out of a... a, Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers in 2020, it wasn't due to COVID, um, or like a lot of people, but I moved across the country away from the, the Midwest to, as I've said already in this podcast, Philadelphia. I felt so lonely and so alone, especially because my wife was working incredibly hard hours as a medical resident, that outside of a few people, I felt so alone and in such a foreign place that I do not feel comfortable in. Aaron Rodgers and the Packers brought me incredible amount of joy. So I always bring that up, and I've never really gotten to say that online uh, in an official forum because... I, I just like as much as he gets shit on for his crazy and wild opinions, which I do not agree with for the most part. Um, I have to give credit where it's credit to Aaron Rodgers brought a lot of happiness to me in the, in the last three years that he played in, in green Bay um, more so than before. So I have to give that to Aaron Rodgers, and I always say thank you for it. Um, but when we're assessing the situation in New York, you can still tell that Rodgers can spin it. Rodgers is still as accurate as ever. Rodgers is still a downfield passing threat. Rodgers is still a phenomenal player. The Achilles is going to be something new and interesting to watch and pretty exciting and also difficult to evaluate. But this is my first... This is one of the highest assess the situations I have because where do you go after this year and what do you do if you don't get an offensive line? I mean, it, it's so obvious and abundantly clear after only what, four plays, five minutes, you got Aaron Rodgers for five minutes in New York. That absolutely sucks for any team. Whether you like him or not, you have to say it sucks. And... Aaron does have way too much sway in that building from all outward appearances and reports by really good journalists and with good sourcing that Aaron has too much control over that team. And yeah, it's it. That's the hard part with the assessment. I still think the player, as long as he heals up from the Achilles, well, I could not I would still not be shocked if Aaron Rodgers in New York somehow some way just willed himself to another MVP just to prove everybody wrong cuz he has such a chip on his shoulder. Aaron has such a fuck you attitude about so many things that I do appreciate, although sometimes I feel it's unfounded, I do appreciate. I wouldn't be shocked if he somehow played MVP football. Again, I truly believe that. But he needs to get players to block for him. And right now, the Jets don't really have that. That needs to be fixed. I'm going to say assess the situation on Aaron Rodgers at number eight for the Jets. Number seven. It's mostly because the situation is so much better. It's Matt Staff, Matthew Stafford and the Rams. Matthew Stafford was playing lights out football, and in Detroit in that playoff game, he was lighting it up too. Matthew Stafford played really, really well in that game. No one can take that from him. After recovering from injury, Matthew Stafford proved once again that he was always a top 10 quarterback. He just needed a team around him that actually knew what they were doing. And while he was in Detroit, they didn't have that. But the arm strength is still there. The accuracy is still there. The decision-making is at an all-time high. And now he has two really dependable good receivers, not just one. And he has a phenomenal play caller in Sean McVay. The situation's so good. You're set. As long as his health stays, you are set in Los Angeles. 
I wish I had more to say other than just, yeah, he's damn good and he's great with Matthew Stafford, but he played so well and he's already proven it for so long. Matt Staff in, and the Rams are good. You are all set as long as everything pans out health-wise. Number six. One of the most complex situations on this list is Dak Prescott and the Cowboys. This is where I may unfortunately venture into a little bit of sports talk radio, which I am not trying to be because for the most part I find a lot of mid-tier sports talk radio to be incredibly incessant and ignorant when it comes to the sport. But I will say this. Dak Prescott has now had more than enough chances to prove that he can be a big-time quarterback when the moment is big. And he hasn't done it. And not only has he not done it, in the vast majority of those cases, he didn't even show up. And before any Dallas Cowboy fan that doesn't want to say anything bad about Dak says it, he didn't show up in the wild card game until the game was over and the Packers kind of just took their foot off the gas a little bit and all of a sudden it was like, oh, this is getting close. It's like, no, it's not. The score of that game was nowhere near what it actually was. However, Dak Prescott played MVP level football through the entire regular season. He's a phenomenal regular season quarterback. No one can deny that. Um, He's at least won a playoff game now. But I believe the I believe this is a true record. Jordan Love has more playoff wins in AT and T Stadium than Dak Prescott. Jordan Love's played in two playoff games. <laughs> Dak played exceptionally well this year, and I know I really hate to start with the negative, but I I felt the need to do that to frame what I'm going to say. You need to assess the situation for a multitude of reasons with Dak. Number one, Dak's contract is insane this upcoming year. To the point where it's going to probably force Dallas to give him a new one just so they can keep their other good players. Micah Parsons needs to get re-signed. CeeDee Lamb needs to get re-signed. Guess what? There are other players that are going to want to bump. And you're going to need to somehow figure out a way to not only keep the pieces you have, but then go hunt the other pieces that you didn't have to get you over the hump in Dallas. That is a huge situation as to why you need to assess it with Dak Prescott. Number two is what I was talking about before. Do you believe Dak Prescott can go when you're the big one? That's a real thing. And it's, it's truly not meant out of disrespect for Dak. It's just what we have seen time in and time out again. This is not Kyle Shanahan where it's overblown and he's just going up against Patrick Mahomes twice and getting unfair criticism for a Dan Quinn team that he was a part of as the offensive coordinator. You know, like, this is a player that has continually not shown up in big moments. Gets his ass kicked in big moments. So, like, what are you going to do but assess the situation? He's a really good quarterback. I'm not going to deny that. He deserves a lot of credit for that. He has the arm strength. He has the talent to get the ball there. He can move around. He can still make the play go while it breaks down. Dak has that ability. But he's just, he's continually not coming up in big moments, and his contract is getting so exorbitant that you're not going to be able to keep the other pieces that really keep that team functional alongside him. So that's why you have to assess the situation with Dak Prescott. And here's where we go to the top five. This might be a little one crazy compared to some of the other evaluations. Top five in the NFL, we start here. Number five, the Los Angeles Chargers and Justin Herbert. Uh, anyone who wants to criticize this one, I will tell you this. They're going to say, well, the Chargers haven't done anything. What has Char- Justin Herbert done? I'll tell you what Justin Herbert's done. He's played it on a team that can't stay healthy at all. And before anyone says, well, I mean, he couldn't stay healthy, he's had one actual injury. It's kind of crazy. He's played exceptionally well and taken all of the good players in this league that he's played against to the limit or beaten them. And now he has a cutthroat coach that I truly believe in in Jim Harbaugh. That's the one thing that you can add about Hope Season is now the current situation is Jim Harbaugh, who's great at coaching quarterbacks, by the way, 
now has one of the top five talents in the league right now in Justin Herbert. That is another reason why I'm exceptionally high in Justin Herbert, besides the fact that his play has been tremendous. It's just he has no receivers to stay healthy, no running backs to stay healthy, no tight ends to stay healthy, no offensive line to stay healthy. Oh, by the way, he's had no defensive ends stay healthy or defensive line to stay healthy or linebackers to stay healthy or secondary to stay healthy. Like, the greatest enemy of the Chargers is the Chargers' health and whoever's helping assess their health situations in the past. I think that's going to change with Jim Harbaugh. I truly believe that. And the talent is all there. The play has already shown that. Justin Herbert's a top five quarterback, especially in the situation he's going to be in with the LA Chargers. So number five, Justin Herbert. He's he's light years ahead of most quarterbacks. You have to give him that in the talent perspective. Number four, Joe Burrow. Um, I actually am a little bit lower on Joe Burrow than a lot. I think Joe Burrow is actually the dirty word of overrated. However, Joe Burrow has completely shown the ability to show up in big moments, to be clutch, only active player to be Patrick Mahomes in the playoffs. I mean, I know that's kind of just a dumb, crazy metric, but it's a true metric. But Joe Burrow has shown to have the killer clutch gene that others don't. I think Joe Burrow is actually a little bit more limited, especially now after injury again, than we're going to give him credit for. The season kind of showed that, although he was working through injury and making his way back. He was just starting to look a little bit like the old Joe Burrow before he injured the wrist and the hand. Um, However, I think Burrow's tendency to hold the ball a little too long is why I don't have as much high as high a regard as others do. But I have a high regard for Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow from the fact that he is incredibly clutch, incredibly smart, makes good decisions with the ball, and he's a really accurate passer. And he does have enough arm strength, enough arm talent to, to pull his team to victory. So that those ingredients alone, he's a great player. And with his accomplishments thus far in the NFL, he does he does deserve to be in a top five mix. So Joe Burrow is my number four in Cincinnati. Obviously, you are good, along with, if I didn't say it, along with the Chargers and Justin Herbert. Now, the creme de la creme, the top three. Number three, Lamar Jackson. Um, People are going to have a little bit of criticism for Lamar, just like Dak. I can't say I agree, but I can't say I disagree either with the results. Um, However... Lamar clearly, this year specifically as an MVP season, showed he could develop as a passer, and that was always the greatest critique of Lamar. Everybody knew he was the greatest running quarterback of all time. That includes Michael Vick. And I do mean that, because I have a very high regard for Michael Vick, the player, as a running threat. But Lamar already surpassed Michael Vick as a running threat earlier in his career, and now he's doing what Michael Vick did when he got to be with Andy Reid in Philly. He's developing as a passer, and the passing game in Baltimore was the first real passing game they've had in almost a decade since the earlier years of Joe Flacco. Lamar can pass now. He still can run. I'm not sure he has the same explosion anymore, which does suck to see because it's such a fun, explosive play when he is in the open field and can just be himself and carry the ball. But without question, you you can't argue the fact that Lamar has been playing tremendous football every time he's been on the field. There's no doubts about that. Lamar has truly shown to be MVP caliber and a great quarterback, and he is top three in my mind in the NFL. So obviously, Baltimore, you are all good at the quarterback position. Number two, Josh Allen. It's like watching, when he is on, it's like watching Superman without the rest of the Justice League when he needs the Justice League. (laughs) Like, they asked Josh Allen to do so much. And Josh Allen does show up in big games. He does. He just gets out-dueled by Patrick Mahomes. 
and the rest of his team kind of lets him down, kind of like they did in Buffalo this year. He just can't beat Patrick Mahomes. It's kind of been the knock. Um, But Josh Allen is a tremendous player. Most arm strength in the league I don't think is arguable as Josh Allen. Um, Can make pretty much every throw on the field. Tremendous running threat. That goes without question. And Buffalo is all the better for having Josh Allen. He needs help. And I would like him to be able to develop a little bit more as a decision maker and get away from the running game a little bit and use that to your advantage when you need it, not just do it to do it sometimes. Sometimes it does feel like he doesn't trust people and he does that. But he needs to develop even more as just the killer passer, which he already is, but he needs just that little push to get him over the edge to get him in that territory of winning a Super Bowl, and he needs help. But more importantly, he needs help from the Buffalo team in the front office to get him the players he needs around him to keep him upright and catch the ball and get over the hump. But number two, without question, is Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills. You are all set at the quarterback position. Let's get to the most obvious thing that will ever be said in the history of the Internet. Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback in the NFL. Patrick Mahomes, in my opinion, is already the best quarterback to ever play the position. Yes, I said it. I meant it. I don't care what you say. I believe it to be absolute truth. No one's have a better start. The statistics show that as well. Everyone wants to say, oh, Brady had seven. I don't, Tom Brady couldn't do half the things Patrick Mahomes can do. Patrick Mahomes, I believe, is the ultimate mix of the mental side of the game, the controlling aspects of the game the quarterback needs to have, the killer instinct, the Michael Jordan-esque takeover the game aspect of it. He's the most Michael Jordan-esque athlete the NFL has ever seen. And the fact when it's big time, that weird, eerie quiet comes over him, and you just know Patrick Mahomes is going to win. I said this in last week's episode. I will say it again. I have, I am not an overly religious person. I have the utmost faith in one thing in this world, and it is Patrick Mahomes winning a football game. That is pure truth. Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback to ever play this game. He has all the mental tools to be the best, and he has the most physical tools of a quarterback of that caliber has ever had. Oh, and by the way, he's also a really, really good running quarterback, which most of the guys in the top-tier list of quarterbacks in NFL history didn't have his running ability either. So, yeah, Patrick's kind of number one. I think Kansas City's going to be okay with Patrick Mahomes as the quarterback. I think they're going to be okay. That is our entire list, ranked 32 to 1 here on the Oneta Football Show. I had to put the glasses on just to help out a little bit. But there you go. That's 1 to 32 or 32 to 1, if you will. In summary, we have seven situations, I believe, that need to be fixed, 13 that need to be assessed, and 12 that are completely good. And a lot of those assessed situations are positive situations as well. Um, such as I still think Brock Purdy's a positive situation for San Francisco. Uh, I think Tampa Bay with Baker Mayfield's a positive situation. Obviously, Dallas and back, Dak Prescott, I think it is still a positive, even though there are concerns there. Um, and I do think Bryce Young, even there is some positive there that with any help, he might be at least be able to get better. Not the same level of good as the previous three. I want to make that clear. But I still think there's some positive there in a lot of the assess the situations. Um, but there's still a lot of quarterback play that gets, needs to get cleaned up in the NFL for us to hit total quarterback saturation from an, all 32 teams have a great quarterback. But this is why you need to do exercises like this in the offseason so you can truly understand what your needs are, where you're at. If you just get, we, well, we got our quarterback and you don't really look at it, you don't look at cap. You don't look at team history with that player. If you don't look at injury history with that player, you don't look at the X factors around that player that allow them to accentuate their positives and hide their deficiencies. If you do not have those that exercise in mind, you're not doing your due diligence as both a fan or a front office member either. You need to do all that, and that's why I, I did this during the start of – Hope season as we're getting in a draft and going to see all these wonderful new players enter the NFL. Um, that is 
the main topic of the show today. However, I'm not going to leave you without anything else. So, I want you to check this one out too. It's your promo code. I understand it says Pokemon in the top left corner. That is because it is a tie-in to the Pokemon content here on the PTE Creative Channel. But use the promo code BLISS, B-L-I-S-S, on our Etsy shop, ptecreative.etsy.com. Use that promo code BLISS, and you will get 20% off any order of two items or more, and that sale ends March 13th. There's more than just Pokemon content and Pokemon merchandise there. There's all kinds of cool adventure stuff, there's even more fictional stuff, and there's soon to be even more football stuff on there. So even if you visit right after watching this video, you're like, ah, he doesn't really have everything I need up there. There's going to be even more football stuff coming your way. So continually check that out. And it really helps out the channel. And it really helps out your boy who's trying to make some art work out for him as well. But use promo code BLISS for 20% off any order of two items or more at ptcreative.etsy.com. You will reward yourself. Once again, thank you as always for watching the Oneta Football Show. Like, comment, subscribe for more. Comment, tell me what you think of the list. I can't wait for the Tua haters and the Jalen Hurts lovers just to come at me. I can't wait to hear. I'd love to hear if I was right in your opinion. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. I don't care. That's part of the discourse here. It's part of the fun is getting to share your opinion and seeing what you do with it. But beyond that, thank you so much for watching. Continually check every Monday through Friday for new content on the PT. Create a YouTube channel. And I will smell y'all later. Sup, boy? Peace, love, and hugs to all of you. Thank you so much for watching.